Hey everyone, thanks for coming to um, see Kevin today. My name's Hal Bailey, and I met Kevin through a friend of mine, lifelong friend, Andrew McDermott, so we should thank him just as much. But Kevin's here to talk about climbing and why it's fun to him, um, essentially the fun scale. Um, a little background on Kevin, he's been climbing for about 15 years. Um, he is local to the area, he's from Santa Rosa. Um, he started out in a gym and has sort of made his way outside from since then, since he was younger. And he um, now climbs all over the world, but there's one project he's been working on for four years. It's in Yosemite called the Don Wall. It's a sustained 515, it's about 3,000 feet, and it's a pretty intense climb. Um, the other thing, other than just being a great climber, Kevin's also one of the best climbing instructors I've ever met. Um, he set up some programs, he set up frameworks and structure around learning how to climb, and he started a group called PCI, um, the Pro Climbers Institute? International, International Pro Climbers International, um, and where he's taken the best climbers in the world who have the ability and interest in teaching, and he's bringing that to mortals like you and me, or at least I think most of y'all are mortals. Um, so anyway, I'll let Kevin take it from here, but let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. I'm definitely stoked to be here. Um, I've heard a lot about Google. I visited one time before. I think the thing that stood out to me the most is, um, when I think about Google, is the culture of this, this organization and this, this company. And I love how vital that culture is when I came to visit with Hal and I, was, I felt it. And that's what really led me to want to share this culture of climbing as well because I have a feeling they're really gonna mesh quite well together. So today I have three different things I wanna do. I want to, one more. I want to introduce you guys both to myself my sport, if you haven't tried climbing before, and my organization, Professional Climbers International. I want to hopefully inspire you guys to try climbing through some of the adventures I've been on. And then last, I want to invite you to join me both today at 2 o'clock on the Google wall for a free clinic. But then we're also going to be doing some ongoing climbing classes on the Google wall twice a month, January, February, March. And we're bringing in some of the world's best special for that clinic series. So at the end of the talk, we can take names that are interested for that. You can come climb, and we can you know, make sure that everyone that wants to participate can. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and kick off. My name is Kevin Jorgensen again. And like Hal said, I've been climbing for 15 years. And I was born to climb, I feel like. I always was climbing cupboards. And whenever I would get lost, my parents would look up instead of down and, or under things to find me. So I think it was just a matter of time before I found climbing. And I found climbing, so to speak, when I went to an outdoor retail shop for the first time and they had a climbing wall. But they wouldn't let me climb it because I wasn't 16. Luckily, Vertex Climbing Center up in Santa Rosa was opening shortly thereafter. And it was all over once I had been to Vertex. So this photo is actually from probably my first ever experience with a climbing wall. Uh, aside from that outdoor retail shop. And has anyone ever, or do you remember Marin Outfitters up in uh, Santa Rosa? They were in business before REI moved next door. And this was right in their, their parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely stoked. So over the past 15 years, I've gone from climbing and competing indoors, you know, winning national championships and competing internationally, to just moving exclusively to climbing outside. And to me, there's nothing more inspiring than a beautiful line. And when it comes to beautiful lines, it's really hard to compete with El Cap. Has anyone ever been to Yosemite? Tell me most of you have been since we're so close. It is, if you haven't been, go. It's less than four hours from here if you speed, and it's worth it. Uh, <laughs> so this, we'll get into what this project is, but um, let's just say that climbing has taken me many amazing places, and I'm going to share that journey with you guys. So a little bit about climbing if you haven't climbed before. Can I see who's definitely climbed, rock climbed, indoors or outdoors before? Oh, then you know. OK, so there's a couple different disciplines, as you're aware. You can freeze 
and be at the you know danger of avalanches all the time through mountaineering. And how you know that's your thing, but not for me. Sorry. You can go sport climbing, which is fun, single or multi-pitch bolted climbs. That's the photo in the middle from Smith Rocks. Or you can go bouldering, which is just fun, ropeless, accessible. You can do it indoors. You can do it outdoors. All you need are shoes, chalk, and a crash pad. It's great. And I think that's one of the things that draws me to climbing so much is that it is so versatile. With a slight change in angle or location, you can find yourself uh, still participating in climbing, but maybe be, you know, soloing over the ocean in Mallorca, or you know, up on a peak in Alaska, or on a boulder field in in Bishop. It's really versatile to meet kind of anyone's version of climbing. So, really, it's open to all participants, which I absolutely love. So, three years ago, we started an organization called Professional Climbers International, and our goal is to develop and inspire the next generation. And we do that through a number of different programs and events, but one is through you know, large stage competitions like the photo on the left, but also through instructional programs like we do in schools, you know, like here at Google, and um, all over the place. And this, this happens to be the same climber. He's winning the competition on the left, and teaching a clinic to adults and kids in New York last year. And he, we were actually, Daniel was here too, day before yesterday in Sunnyvale at Planet Granite, if you guys have been there. Myself, Alex Johnson, a two-time World Cup champion, um, US female climber was there, and so was Daniel. So that's enough for the, the introduction of uh, myself, of climbing, of PCI. And I, I kind of want to dig into the, the fun and, to me, more inspiring part. So in September 2009, was, it was kind of an interesting period for me. In January, I'd finished a lifelong goal. Well, maybe not lifelong, but you know, it, it really led up to, it was, a, it was a particular climb called Ambrosia. It was this really dangerous, um, really tall boulder problem. And I was kind of lost. If you've ever climbed, you ever go through post-send depression? Or maybe you finish a project of some kind, whatever, it doesn't have to even be climbing. You finish it and you're like, oh, now what do I do? And I was, having a serious case of post-send depression in September 2009, and I didn't know what I was going to do next. And as a professional climber, it's all about pushing yourself and having an inspiring project to, to look forward to and to work on and progress toward. And I didn't know where I was going, which I, really is not a you know, nice place to be. So in September, I saw the Real Rock Film Tour, and it featured Tommy Caldwell on um, the Donwall Project. And it sure looked like he needed a partner. So I called him up, and I was like, I'm nothing but a pebble wrestler. You know, you're a you know, uh, big wall climber, but hey, I would love to help you out if you would have it. And you know, he wrote a funny article recently where he said, you know, what's the worst I would get out of having Kevin come for a season? You know, I get a belay partner, I burn through him, and then I'll get another one. But you know, on our first day, it was really clear that like, we climbed really well together, we were having fun, and that we had forged, forged both a friendship and a partnership that was going to last the duration of this, this project. So this is the line that the Don Wall takes. And every other free climb on El Cap follows a very clear system of cracks. The majority of the climbs all across the wall are called aid climbs. And that means you're, you're standing on and pulling on gear as you go. When you think of climbing, you're, you're probably picturing free climbing. Hands and feet, you're doing the moves yourself. Free climbing on El Cap, same thing. You have the ropes there, though. You're not going to die if you fall. The Don Wall takes the blankest feature of El Cap and tries to climb it. I mean, it's quite the audacious objective. And Tommy deserves all the credit in the world for looking at that wall and even believing that it was possible. So without that, there's no way I would be working on this project right now. So I remember standing in the meadow on day one, looking at the wall. Met him, met him in the meadow for the first time. I mean, this is a childhood hero of mine. I've watched him. He's uh, 33. I'm 28. So I was literally watching him in the magazines and the videos when I started. I was like, oh, Tommy, how's it going? Where does this thing go? I mean, the wall is so blank. There was no obvious place to go, like with the nose or the Salathe or the Zodiac. All these other climbs have very clear places to go. So began the Donwall project. And the thing about 
climbing. Oh wait. Probably one of the craziest dinos I've ever tried and it's like right in the middle of El Cap, so <laughs> it's sick. I'm just not the best dino in the world, but uh, I think somebody could do it. When I look at this next generation of climbers that are doing things on the boulders and the sport climbs that I really couldn't conceive of, if they could apply that kind of talent to the big walls, and that's what it would take to free climb this project. Even if I can't climb this, I wanted to plant the seed for somebody in the future to come and inspire us all. Now that's a classic Tommy line, being super humble, you know, oh, I'm just planting the seed for someone else to come do this. Tommy's going to climb this thing, and I, I, you know, I hope to be on that team with him. You know, there's nothing that's going to stop us from seeing it through to the end. But, you know, that was kind of the call to action that I saw in that film in September that was like, well, he's really putting it out there to every discipline within climbing to step up and help make this project happen. Now, the thing about a project like the Don Wall is you will never, ever do it in a season. Even if you're Adam Andra, who's arguably the best climber in the world right now, he couldn't come to Yosemite and do this thing in a season. There's a lot that goes into climbing a big wall of this size and this difficulty. And inevitably, it's not all fun as we may normally think about it. So in alpinism and in climbing, and I'm sure in, in other um, you know, industries or, or sports, there's this idea of the fun scale. And that definitely applies to climbing and the Donwall project in particular. And even if it's not, you know, as fun as jumping in a foam pit, you know, you can still actually, you know, view it as a, as a kind of fun. So I just want to go through the, the types of fun. So type one is simple. It's what we think of fun. It's the pure, unqualified, silly fun. Foam pits, climbing walls for the first time. And in the case of the Don Wall, taking a magic carpet ride in 60 mile an hour updraft winds is pretty darn fun. <laughs> Tommy didn't want to break down the portal ledge and then reset it up in the wind, so he just sat on it and levitated his way down the wall. <laughs> or fun is forgetting your can opener every night and having to use a, uh, they call it a, a pecker in order to open your dinner. Always, always. I don't think we've ever opened a can with a can opener on a cap. No, I'm serious. I don't think we've ever opened a can with a can opener on a cap. For some reason, we either forget it or leave it in the hall bag a pitch down or something. So we're always hoping that we have our, our beaks nearby so we can eat dinner. But Or you can have type 1 fun in the form of a 100-foot rope swing. I did this <laughs> Are you all clipped in okay? I think so. Gregory, Gregory. Wall lock. You're, you're this is like a baby port string. Baby port string. Technique wasn't perfect. No, I don't know if that's everyone's definition of fun, but the, to me, that's like complete type one. That's just pure bliss. <laughs> So you can see there's a, there's a lot of time on the wall that's not just spent climbing. And you kind of have to see the fun in the entire process in order to engage in a project that's going to last three, four, five, six years. Who knows how long it's going to take? It's been four already. Um, can you guys see our, our camp here? That's our camp that we were based out of. That photo was taken less than a month ago. We spent uh, October and November, that's kind of the, the best season for working on this project. And that's about uh, maybe a thousand feet up. If you know the nose route, this is El Cap Tower, this is Texas Flake, and then there's the Boot Flake up higher. And you can just see how really blank that section is. But again, for me, to be in that kind of position, just pasted to the side of the wall, to be able to wake up and make your French press coffee in the morning, it's just like complete type one fun. Unfortunately, well, I don't know, somewhat fortunately, it's not all type one fun, either with a project like this or of that difficulty or for that long. You kind of have to endure the whole scale. So 
Type 2 is kind of interesting. It's not that fun when you're actually going through it. But when you look back on it, yeah, it's pretty fun. You're like, oh, you know, you're in it, you're doing it, you're like, oh, this is absolute, this sucks. And then you look back, it's kind of like the things that make a really good story. You're like, oh, this is so terrible. And then, you know, by 5 o'clock, you're like, that was so cool. I did that. Yeah, no, no big deal. It was, I was having fun the whole time. Um, so terrible in the moment, you know, taking the tape off of a bloody flapper wound uh, after a day of bouldering. But fun in retrospect is realizing that you have a heart-shaped flapper under that piece of tape that <laughs> you'll never, ever see ever again. So let's see. What else do we have for type 2 fun? 10 o'clock. Just did pitch 7 a couple hours ago. And now we're going to do pitch 8. But we need a little pick-me-up. We just ate dinner. Kind of ready for a nap. <laughs> So what are you doing for a little pick-me-up? I think I'm going to take this instant <laughs> coffee powder, <laughs> pour it into my mouth, <laughs> and swig some water and <laughs> instead of brewing it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but when I describe it, it seems like a bad idea. Sure, wall laziness. <laughs> Pretty much. You even have a stove right next to you. I'm really afraid of how much I'm going to put in my mouth. <laughs> This is the type two moment right here. Okay. How's it taste? Is it dissolving? Mm -hmm. Is it warming up? Let's see your smile. Oh, Not bad. <laughs> It's a little brutal when it first hits your tongue, but when you mix it up, it's going to taste like cold coffee. Yeah, maybe you should um, stick that packet up to your left nostril and just snort the rest of it. I need a little more fluff. Wait, did you just do that for real? I'm not going to snort the instant coffee. I'm not that tired. <laughs> It'll hit your bloodstream faster. Yeah. <laughs> so that was in the middle of a week-long ground-up effort in 2010 where we would start climbing around 4 o'clock each day when the wall went into the shade and then climb until we were too tired because when the wall is in the sun, it's just simply too hot to hang on to the holds because they're so small. You know, if you know, a lot of you have climbed, so you know how important conditions can be. And that's one of the biggest battles on this wall, is with the conditions. And some of the best conditions just happen to be in the middle of the night. But, you know, when you get tired, you got to do what you got to do. And it worked out well. We did the next pitch that night and uh, took a rest day the next day. All right. And there's a lot of elements of this project that aren't ideal. You know, the conditions like we talked about with the sun. Another is that there are certain sections of the route that are just always wet. No matter what, always wet. Pitch 10 is one of those. This wet streak is so big you can see it from the ground. It's 100 feet long, and it happens to be in the middle of a 514 pitch. So you do a bunch of lie backing, and then the holds don't get any better, and the feet don't get any better. Everything just turns to slime. And there's nothing you can do except grit your teeth and get through it. And half the time, you just slide right out. But it's kind of one of those moments as well where, you know, you're getting through it and you're like, oh, this is awful. But then you kind of zoom out and realize, I'm climbing a 514 wet pitch. This is so cool. And then you're like, oh, this is really slippery. I'm going to fall. And you're all gripped because the gear's bad. And if you fall, you're going to zipper it all the way to the belay. But, you know, when you, when you finish the pitch, yeah, it's kind of back to that type 1 feeling. But you have to go through, you have to get through the wet stuff in order to get the elation. And I don't know, to me, type 2 is... One of the most rewarding types of fun. I really enjoy type two. And then there's type three. <laughs> it's just never fun. The, now, now, the cool thing about type three is it makes for the best story. But, you know, when you look back on it, whether it be an injury or, a, you know, a close brush with death or something, you know, type three is just something that you look back on and you just don't want to repeat any part of it whatsoever. 
So let's see what we have for type three. We talked about conditions. Sometimes, you know, to get the good conditions, you have to wake up in terrible hours of the morning. And pardon my French for naming my alarms, but that's pretty much what it feels like to wake up at two in the morning to go rock climbing. Um, <laughs> There's nothing that fun about lugging an 80-pound load of gear to the top of El Cap. I'm just going to throw it out there. You know, done it a lot of times by now, and you know, I thought, oh, maybe it'll just turn into type 2, kind of like the runner's endorphin. You get to the top, it feels great. That, how, that was the first time it was type 2. Every time after that, type 3, over it. <laughs> there was about one second of type two. I don't think I would have reacted like that if Matt didn't start yelling. I think he was just stoked that I didn't break my legs. But this was in England in 2008. I went on this trip as a training trip for that uh, Ambrosia objective, uh, which I did that January. And all of the routes in England are really sketchy. Nothing is bolted anywhere on the grit stone. It's all, all trad. So if there's no cracks, there's no, ge there's no gear. And obviously the, the gear is super low on this one. And this is already kind of an infamous route. It's called Gaia. And if you've seen these underground climbing movies, hard grit, you get to watch someone take that exact same fall, but break his leg. So I was like, oh, I really want to climb Gaia, but I really don't want to break my leg. And then sure enough, trying to, to onside it, my left foot blows and I nearly break my legs. So the good thing was that, A, that's Alex Honnold. He ran backwards and kept me from breaking my legs because he pulled in the slack as I was falling. And the second thing is he moved this crash pad up against the arete. But my, my heels still struck. So for the next week, I was walking around. I don't know, does an ostrich walk like right on their toes? But I couldn't step on my heels for a week. So that was definitely a moment of type three for me. Looking back, I have no desire to do that whatsoever. But it's good footage, right? It's good. Type three, that's the nature of type three. Um, you know, the, luckily, I think it's really special that uh, this project has taken so long. You get to experience all parts of the success and the failure that goes along the way with working something so hard. Um, you know, the partnership that Tommy and I have forged over the last four years is, it's awesome. I mean, we balance each other out really well when you're going through so much challenge and, and difficulty and, and a lot of physical pain at times. You know, you got to have someone there that has your back that can complement your weaknesses and your strengths. And, you know, luckily, Tommy and I balance each other out really well. You know, <laughs> we may appear a little bored at times when Belang since up at two in the morning, but that's all just part of the game. And it takes you amazing places. I mean, you don't get to climb a pitch like that without going through a little type two fun and sometimes some type three fun. But, you know, in this particular moment, pure bliss. And, you know, thanks to Jimmy Chin for capturing such an amazing shot. So everyone always asks, if you haven't climbed a big wall, you know, how do you go to the bathroom up on the big wall? So, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, if I don't tell you now, you're going to ask me afterwards. So I figured I'm just going to... Let, let a video take care of it. I love portal ledges. I can't tell you how much I love portal ledges. We just live in them up here. Why do you love them? No exposure. We can hang out in the middle of the blankest wall in the world. We're kind of cozy right now. We can just like take a nap. What's Kevin doing over there? <laughs> Kevin is urinating in a windstorm right now. <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> it means he's probably going to get pissed all over himself, and us, and the wall, and anybody within a quarter mile radius of us. <laughs> Kevin, how's it going? <laughs> no, it's technique. Legs slightly spread. Right now he's trying to dig it out from <laughs> between his harness. I'm going to blow him around a little bit. You have cold feet, Kevin? Oh, there it goes. <laughs> the little raindrops. <laughs> <laughs>
flying upward. <laughs> Like dancing. He has somewhat experienced that he's going with the wind. Because if he was going against the wind right now, he would be getting so wet. <laughs> this isn't embarrassing at all. Is that your leg or your foot? Looks like you're peeing right on your leg right now. What did he just say? He said that was the cleanest wind pee ever. Success. He only, only served the people on the nose. That <laughs> <laughs> blew by a lot. That whole ledge, I bet, just got like hammered. Anybody? Anybody? Well, there you go. Um, so, with the, you know, that adage is, is true, though. It, you know, if at first you don't succeed, you definitely have to try, try again. And, and it's interesting to experience the evolution of this project over the last four years. Year one, my eyes were just completely opened to how challenging this objective was. We didn't even know where the route was going to go at that stage. Year two, we knew where everything went, you know, where we had to add bolts, we added bolts. We knew what gear we needed. And we also knew that it was just way over our heads. Year three, we gave it a good ground up effort. Um, I got an injury, that setback, and then this year we focused all of our effort two months on two pitches, on the crux pitches, the crux 400 feet, and we made a lot of little micro, micro beta breakthroughs, like little sequence changes here and there to to help uh, to help us get through. And it's funny, like the littlest change in in your sequence can open up all kinds of confidence to your chances of success. But if we had only tried it for two years or for three years, it would still feel completely impossible. So I'll be the first to admit that there are times in this project where it just feels like I'm trying for no reason, that this thing is so hard, and that there's no way that it's ever going to happen. By still just trusting that, you know, by chipping away, it's going to become more feasible. You are getting stronger. You are getting more, you know, tuned into the route that it will happen. And now for, for the first time, I feel confidence in our chances, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, there's, there, we wouldn't be trying this route for this long if we didn't enjoy type one through three that goes along with this route. Um, and that was enough. But now it almost feels like, wow, we can actually, we can actually do this thing. So. That's been a really exciting process to go through. And if you're in the middle of anything like that yourself, some multi-year epic project, I encourage you to just keep going because you know, th there's light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. And your skills hone in. And I'm sure you've all been through it no matter what as far as taking on something that you have no business doing, but then doing it one day. And we haven't even done this thing yet. And we'll be back next year. I'm going to go in the spring, and I'm going to go in the fall, and we're going to keep doing that until we send. But without, without that process and without accepting that fun isn't always type one fun, it's not always type two fun, you kind of have to accept that some days it's just going to suck and it's not going to be fun at all. But really, it's worth it. It makes for good stories that I can share with you guys and hopefully talk you into come climbing with me. And uh, yeah. so. What I would def definitely like to do is introduce all of you and anyone you know within Google to come climbing with us in January, February, and March. Twice a month for those three months, we're going to have some of the world's top climbers on your climbing wall introducing you guys to climbing if you haven't done it before and helping hone your, your mental strengths, your technical abilities, and your physical training. Um, on the Google wall. And then my goal from there is to have gathered up all those interested in climbing and who already climb that work at Google and do even more cool stuff, whether that's outdoor trips or you know, doing meetups at the local climbing gyms, of which there are a ton here in the Bay Area. So, and all of this starts today at 2 o'clock on the climbing wall. So we brought harnesses and shoes, no experience, no equipment necessary. Just come hang out for an hour and a half and, and try it. I encourage you just to come try. And uh, if nothing else, you'll have some type two fun at worst, which will make for a good story, um, <laughs> which isn't a bad way to go. So it's win-win it's no matter what. So I have a couple of um, 
flyers if anyone wants to take a little reminder for the clinic series that's going to start in January. Otherwise, come find me after the talk or at the wall, and um, we can make sure that we stay in touch so that we get to climb together from here on out. And at this point, if you have any questions, please fire away. So you're working on these projects, and I'm not sure, quite sure how it goes, but you accumulate a lot of knowledge over like four years. How do you record it? How do you, like, what happens if your partner decides he wants to go like, and do yeah. something else? Yeah. I was talking earlier about the strengths and weaknesses of our, of our partnership. And for me, it's, I bring a Loctite memory when it comes to sequences and gear and all the rest. But I also back that up with meticulous lists of, you know, actual sequences, you know, the list of gear that we need start to finish on every single pitch. That and this thing has been documented by, you know, really talented videographers from Big Up Productions and Sender Films for that Real Rock Film Tour. So it's great. We actually have, you know, a video catalog, if you will, of some of the pitches. So, I mean, if it really came to it, we could go back to those and look at it. But the nature of climbing and, you know, Tommy's been climbing since he was five. I've been climbing since I was 12. Your body really remembers the movement in and of itself at this stage. So after climbing on the pitches for that long, um, it really takes no time to get up and running again. Yeah, of course. So it sounds like you've made a number of attempts on this wall. What, when's the, what happens in the moment when you decide that one of your attempts is over and you're, you're headed back down? You know, we're pretty, we're pretty stubborn. Again, coming back to that balance thing, Tommy's the, the utter optimist. He looks at the weather channel forecast. I'm not a pessimist, but I'm a realist. I look at the NOAA forecast. And, uh, you know, we kind, of, we kind of balance each other out a little bit. And, you know, when looking at a Doppler radar, like in 2010, we're watching this huge storm. Do you guys remember the amount of snow and rain we got a couple years ago? It was absolutely insane. The snowpack was like 250% in Tahoe. We were on the wall right as that storm was hitting. And Tommy's like, I think it's going to go around us. Yeah, I think we should just stick it out. And, you know, we're at the crux pitches. It's not like we have sent the crux pitches. Just did like total denial. I'm like, dude, it's calling for six feet of snow in 12 hours, what are you talking about? But to answer your question, we go until the weather typically forces us off. So we let some external factor come uh, decide for us, because otherwise we, we're just up there. But I was injured last year, for example, and Tommy was up there and had great weather. Our winter last year, remember, was bone dry all the way through February. He spent 16 days on the wall uh, going ground up and finally d decided to come down because he had holes virtually in every single one of his fingertips. And he'd have to sit up there, just sit there in the portal edge for a week for his skin to heal to be able to grab the holds again. So for him, it was like, all right, you know, I've been up here for 16 days. I have to, you know, just the time required to heal and the chances of doing the pitch and the progress he wasn't experiencing, he decided that he was going to wait till next year. But typically, it's, it's weather. Hi. Quick question. You mentioned injuries. Yes. So uh, just curious, sort of when you were injured and if you were sort of, you know, hadn't, having to sit out for a while, how did you stay motivated while you couldn't climb? And what did you learn on the way back when you were trying to recover? You know, after climbing for 15 years, you have a lot of natural ebbs and flows of your motivation, I've realized. And I've realized really not to fight those. And when I hurt my ankle on the wall last year, that was kind of the start of just a natural kind of lull period in my climbing, I felt like. And so I focused a lot on PCI. I focused a lot on teaching and uh, getting more athletes involved and just kind of balancing out the other aspects of what I love about climbing, sharing it with others, you know, being, you know, creating really good programs to get other people into it and really not to force it because that's when it's no longer part of your, your passion and you've turned your passion into a job. And I really am conscious about that balance. Like, I feel like the most fortunate guy ever to be able to make a living doing what I absolutely love. I'd rather be doing nothing. I don't want to be doing anything else. But as soon as I start forcing, I feel like, uh, you know, climbing when I'm not motivated or working when I'm not motivated, then kind of ruins it.
Yeah. Hi. I'm just wondering how much time do you spend in the gym doing cardio or weight training? Or are you always on the wall climbing? You know, the adage goes that the best training for climbing is climbing. But with a project like this, I have reluctantly have to accept that I need to do more than just climb. And getting off the wall this year, I, I hate stretching. I can't even touch what. I can't do it. I, it's, it's embarrassing. I need to be able to touch my toes if I stand any chance of climbing pitch 12 of the Don Wall, period. And I've known that from day one. But only after this season, you know, coming off of, you know, that little bit of progress and that kind of glimmer that we can do this, have I've started like a daily foam rolling and stretching regimen. Not because, you know, I feel like I have to, but all of a sudden I want to. And, you know, we do do uh, cardio days and I don't do a lot of weight opposition training, but I do do ant antagonistic muscle training to keep things balanced. Because with this project, you have to be more than just climbing fit. It kind of breaks you down over the two to three month season that you're in the valley. So you can't show up peaked on day one. You actually have, you're actually training still, if you will, in that first month that you're there. So that by the fourth or fifth week, you're actually peaking. Yeah, yeah, of course. Great talk. Thanks. Uh, you would said that uh, your partner spent 16 days on the wall ground up. Is there another way to spend 16 days on the wall, like starting somewhere other than the ground? Or yeah, you can drop in from the top really? as well. Yeah, from the top of the wall. So this thing is, is so difficult. And looking from the ground, like I said early on, you can't tell where it goes. This route was discovered from the top down. The first thing Tommy did was hike a bunch of rope to the top of El Cap, throw it off the top, and start swinging around, literally trying to connect the dots from top to bottom. Because if we started at the bottom and just tried to push one rope length higher and higher, not knowing if it's free climbable or if this crack connects to the next crack, we would be nowhere near where we are now. And we're already four years in. So the strategy a lot of times is to come in from the top to see where things are. But I would say, no. You're, no one's going to spend 16 days on the wall consecutively without a purpose. And if you're just coming in from the top, you're not sending, you know, you're doing a recon trip, you're working a crux pitch, you're stashing water for the next attempt, you know, you're, you're doing logistics and, and training. So, you know, the pushes that have taken a really long time, you know, some of the historic ones like Warren Harding on the wall of early morning light, he was up there for a month. Um, he's going up from the ground, he wants to send, he doesn't want to bail. You know, when those kinds of things are at stake, you know, the realization of your project, that's when people stay for that long. And, and then you just mentioned uh, leaving water behind. Mm -hmm. From one season to the next, what, have, what do you guys leave? Do nothing. you leave anything? Nothing gets left. Nope. So as you're going up the same pitches over and over again, you're getting really good at like, the lower levels of the game, and then you try to get to the advanced So we've been, level next. what we do is, so now I can tell you every single move of you know, pitch 1 through 18. The crux is in 12, 13, 14, and 15 and 16. They're all, they're all 514. So we feel really confident about those bottom pitches. And now a lot of times what we do in October is drop in from the top and focus our efforts right on those crux pitches because we're confident about what's below and we're confident about what's above. But if we don't have a, a clear game plan for how we're going to do those crux pitches or have the confidence to, to be able to do it, then you're really just climbing up from the ground into a brick wall. So it's really important to know what's coming up and to be confident and have the knowledge necessary to do it. So that requires some top-down tactics as well. But we don't leave anything behind. When we're working on the route, we actually have a rope fixed top to bottom so that we can literally commute across the wall. And any one day we may, you know, ascend up the fixed ropes, you know, halfway up the entire wall. And the next day, you know, climb for 12 hours and then go back down and have some pizza or you know come in from the top and re resupply a camp because we're staying up there two three days at a time um, so but then when the season's over everything comes down and you kind of have a burly type three fun set up and take down mission at the start and end of every season yeah that's where those 80 pound loads come in cool well, if you guys don't have any other questions, I hope to see each and every one of you at 2 o'clock on the wall. We'll cycle you all up at no problem, 
and then we'll uh, add a bunch more dates to the clinic series <laughs> if you guys all show up. But thank you, seriously.